Hello students, it's Dr. Yu. We're now on part two of effective team presenting on how to run Q and A's. So as a preview, here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna first talk about how do you direct a Q and A? So when we're talking about Q and A, of course, we're talking about the question answer session that's either interspersed throughout the team presentation or is held to the end or at the end of the presentation. Then, how do you answer difficult questions? Because I know this is something that always comes up is once we are directing the Q&A and we're, we're fielding questions, what if I get hit with that really hard question that I don't know the answer to? So we'll talk about that. And then how do you help your teammates properly? Because Q&A sessions require teamwork on, on several levels. And we wanna make sure that we're actually helping our teammates when we try to help them and not actually hurting them or hurting the unified front that you're putting out to your audience. So we'll talk about that as well. So how do you run an effective Q&A? Well, first off, you have to know when does the Q&A take place? We have to first talk about that. Sometimes you have an interleaved Q&A and sometimes this is by choice, sometimes this is not by choice. And in an interleaved Q&A, questions and answers will just be asked throughout the presentation. So if this is zero, zero, so this is the beginning of the presentation and here is the end, let's say it's 20 minutes, perhaps a Q&A happens here at, at perhaps the eight minute mark and then maybe around the 14 minute mark and then maybe at the 12, the 18 minute mark or something like that. This could happen voluntarily. Perhaps you decide that you're conveying or presenting complex material and you want to give the audience opportunities to ask as you go. So perhaps at the end of each main point, you're going to let the speaker take a Q&A or the speaker will say, does anybody have any questions so far? And then once nobody asks any questions, you transition to the next speaker. That would be a voluntary circumstance. But this could also be involuntary. Inv involuntary. If it turns out that you have a very active audience and they are just chiming in when they want, then you're, you have an interleaved Q&A by not choice. And then you have isolated Q&As. And isolated Q&As, you get to give your presentation and then just at the end, the Q&A happens. So if you have a passive audience, this is probably what you're gonna end up with unless you, you ask for a Q&A in the middle, you plan to have these. But otherwise, an isolated Q&A will be reserved for the end of the presentation. Now, when it's time for Q&A, there are two different ways to direct questions depending on which format of presentation you use. If you're doing the hosted format where you have a host who interleaves throughout the presentation, by default, the host should be the one who directs the questions. And so the host or the MC will perhaps answer the questions first if the MC knows the answer. If the MC does not know the answer, then the MC can direct the question to the proper person. So if you're the MC, you're kind of like the air traffic controller and you're gonna say, okay, so this question came up. Uh, I think John will answer that quite well. John, what do you think about blah, 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 blah. And then the MC sort of acts as that air traffic controller. Now, this gets complicated because it depends on how the audience also asks the question. If the audience member just says to your team generally, how much will this plan cost? And doesn't specifically ask anyone in particular, then the MC, the, the question is given to the whole group, the MC should then direct that question to the proper expert if the MC doesn't know the answer right away. But if the audience member specifically says, Jake, based on your main point or based on what you said, how much do you think this plan will cost? Well then, Jake has to take the question. In any case, I generally recommend having some kind of note taker. This can be a team member, somebody who's not in the presentation but who is present, or it can be the MC. Here's what the note taker will do. When questions come up, the note taker should note that these questions were asked and the answers that were given. If somebody later says, we'll have to get back to you on that specific information, the note taker should be writing this down. We need to get back to audience member number one about X, Y, and Z. So that way that follow-up happens. Now, the note taker though, if it's possible, could also have a laptop connected to the internet. The note taker 
could then also be sort of like a last minute researcher. So if your team gets asked a difficult question, but it's like a question that is researchable or is something that's like a specific number that you may not know off the top of your head, the note taker would have access to that information and the note taker can then perhaps offer an answer once they've looked it up. In the relay format, it's a little bit different because you have to stick to your lanes, of course, but what I would probably do, even in the relay format, is appoint a temporary host. So have somebody, even though you don't have an official host or MC for that, for the whole presentation, have one person step forward and kind of be that temporary role. And then of course, have a note taker for the exact same reasons. Now, this might be a team member, this could be probably not the temporary host, but probably at least a team member. And they can still be in front of the audience, you know, answering questions, but that will be their role as well. And you can say, Jake is one of our team members, he's gonna take notes during this Q&A, but feel free to ask him questions as well, and that should be totally fine. Now, how do you answer difficult questions? So when you're answering questions, there's some general tips. The first thing is don't repeat a negative. If you have a hostile audience and the audience member says prefaces with something negative, you don't want to repeat the negative phrasing of what they said. So if they say that your company is going under, yeah, our company is going under, blah, blah, blah. No, no. So our company is is going through a struggle right now, you might say, or our company is currently not performing at the level we want. I don't want to say my company is going under because that's repeating that negative affirms that it's true. I also don't like to spend a lot of time evaluating a question, just answer it. So you don't need to say, wow, that's a really, really good question, blah, 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 blah. Just go straight into the answer. And then don't tacitly agree to false statements. So if you have a hostile audience member and they tend to, and they say something that's false, don't tacitly agree to it, make sure to call out that false statement. So seeing how your company only made 2 million last year and then like, blah, 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 what do you think about this? I would first correct the, the premise and say, the number you said 2 million actually is 4 million when you account for blah, 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 blah. So to answer your question with that 4 million figure in mind, blah, 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 blah. So you still wanna be professional, you don't wanna be confrontational, but you don't wanna to agree tacit to, to false statements that might've been embedded in the question or false assumptions within the question. And then a fourth thing, and this happens a lot at academic conferences, but I'm sure it happens too in some business presentations as well. Sometimes somebody will preface and their preface will be like three minutes and it will be basically a speech and you're waiting for a question or they ask five questions in the preface. Don't get frustrated by those. Just take what you can from the speech that they just gave and say, so based on, I know you said a lot here, here's what I gather, you know, you asked about this, so to answer that, blah, 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 blah. Um, it sounds like you're also referring to, to this other thing. Well, here's what, we're, here's what we would say, blah, 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 blah. So just do your best, don't be frustrated. And sometimes it's a, it's a benefit when they do something like that because then you can pick what you want from the question to make yourself look good. Now, what if you get asked a tough question? So a question you don't know the answer to. Now this is of course the scariest part about being in a team presentation is everybody has to do their homework and everybody has to know how to answer questions about their content area. But sometimes you just get asked a question that you just can't anticipate. So here's what you do. There's a, it's a little formula that you do here. First, if you get asked a question you don't know the answer to, start off by saying what you do know. So if you're asked a question about company size, let's say, what's the company size of, or how many employees does this company have? And let's just say you just don't know for some reason, like you just didn't look that up. You didn't think, you thought that was like a trivial matter that wouldn't matter to them. But for some reason you get hit with this question. So start off what you do know. So you can start off by saying, you know, I know that this company is an international conglomerate with 500 locations. What I don't know is how many employees they have because I know they have contractors and they have full-time employees and they're all dispersed throughout multiple locations. And then solution, but I will look up the answer for you and get you that information. So when you answer tough questions, always state what you do know. So you know you don't seem clueless when you're up there and that you can still give yourself credit for whatever like subject matter that you do know. But then state what you don't know. And then it's okay to state why you might not know that, like the complexity of not knowing that answer. But then make sure, so this is the critical thing, you offer a solution. You just don't say, well, I don't know. So I don't know. 
So when you say you don't know, give us a next step. What I'll do though is I'll look that up for you and get you that information or I'll have our note taker write that down and we'll get that to you after the presentation, something like that. Something that just says, we don't know, but we will find you the answer. That's the most critical thing. Now, will this, if, does that mean that I don't need to do homework? No, you gotta do your homework and you gotta be able to answer tough questions. This should be something that should only happen every once in a while. So if you're getting dunced like every single question, you just didn't do your homework, you didn't know your content, and in that case, continually doing this, at some point the audience is gonna go, well, what do you know, right? So this should be used emergencerally because you know your stuff. If you don't know your stuff, then you gotta know your stuff. You gotta learn your stuff, and you have to make sure you study. Some other solutions. If you get asked a question you don't know the answer to, but you think somebody else in your team, is, that's specifically their speaker lane or their expertise lane, I would just transition to that expert. So if I was asked a question about company size, but I know Maggie is our company researcher, I might say, uh, that's a great question. Maggie is our company researcher and she would know more specifically about company dynamics or company sizes. Maggie, can you, can you give them an estimate on that? Okay, and then Maggie can take over the question and then she can answer it accordingly. If you don't think Maggie would know, because maybe this is a question where you don't know whose expertise lane that would go under, you might relay it to the whole group. So you might say, I don't know the exact company size. I, I can ask my team here, do we, do we know the company size on this? And then if somebody knows, they can, they can jump in and say, and, and take over that way. But once again, if you don't know, and let's say you tried to transition to a team expert, the team expert didn't know. You relay to the group and you pass the question to them and nobody chimed in. We will find the answer for you or I will find the answer for you. We will get that for you as soon as we can. And then make sure you follow up on that. So don't say I'll find the answer for you and then just kind of forget about it. Like make sure your note taker is writing this stuff down and then offering it. And hopefully, sometimes, sometimes you get lucky and you get asked a question that's kind of trivial, like it's pretty factual, and your note taker can find that answer during the Q&A and the note taker can, can save you essentially and say, oh yeah, it's actually this number, we looked it up right here. And that's nice. Now, how do you help your teammates? So Q&A is a team effort. It's not five individuals answering questions, it's all of you supporting each other with each other's answers and being there for each other. So when you're helping your teammates, there's a couple things you wanna make sure you do. Let's say you're doing a Q&A and you wanna chime in on somebody else's answer. So somebody's ask, answering a question and you're kinda of like, wait, hold up, like you, know, you want to say something or you wanna chime in. The big thing to do is to signal your intention non-verbally. Do not interrupt your own teammate. One of the things that you have to do in a team presentation is show that you're on a unified front that you're fighting together, you're on the same page, you work together, you're coordinated. And if you're interrupting your teammate, that looks really bad, because interrupting people is rude, you're not treating your teammate well, and it makes your teammate look like they're weak, and it's just all these bad impressions that can be formed around you and your team and your teammate. So you always wanna give like a nonverbal signal, like maybe a hand raise or you know, on that point, and then let them finish, and then signal what you wanna say. Now. Let's say your teammate gives an answer and you know your teammate's answer isn't correct or at the very least isn't like the whole picture. One thing you always wanna do, or if your teammate doesn't know the answer, so let's say your teammate didn't know the answer so your teammate transitions to you, always save face for your teammates. So you never wanna go like, well, John doesn't know his stuff, sorry, you know, John doesn't study, you know, that kind of stuff. You wanna try to make John look as good as possible even if they didn't know the answer or if they got the wrong answer. So, you know, when John gave you the answer for company size, John was specifically talking about full-time employees, and he's exactly right. Full-time employees are this, and we know John does a lot of research and blah, blah. Okay, so you don't have to go that deep, but just say, like, you know, John was thinking of this, but the actual answer on top of full-time employees with contractors, here's the actual answer. So you want to save face. You never want to argue with your own teammate in front of the, the audience. You never want to make a teammate seem like they didn't know anything or they're bad. Try to make them look good. 
And if possible, so let's go back to that example, John not knowing the company size. Let's say John took a guess though, and John said it was 40,000. I think it's around 40,000 people that are employed at this company. And you know that's wrong. Like you're the team expert, he didn't transition to you, but you know that that's the wrong number, it's actually 60,000. So try to yes and John's wrong answer. So I know John said that it was 40,000 employees, but I think what John was just thinking of were, were full-time employees. But if you add the contractors and you also add part-time employees, the number is around 60,000. Okay, so I yes and him. So you learn this in improv to yes and each other to build a scene. Figure out ways, you have, to be, you have to be savvy here. You have to be a little bit creative, but figure out how can I take John's wrong answer and still make it seem right even if it's not right by yes anding it. Okay, so you don't wanna say my teammate is wrong. Wait, that's not what you wanna do. That doesn't look good, doesn't look professional, doesn't make you all look like you're on the same page. So overall, in this lecture series, we looked at what is a team presentation? We looked at how do you structure a team presentation with the hosted and relay format? We talked about blocking a team presentation and how to run an effective Q&A. There's all these things that come into play with a question and answer session. And you have to think of a team presentation, not as baseball, where it's like you're a pitcher and you pitch and then you're done once you're done pitching. You have to think of it more as like football, like the offensive line. You have to know what the person to the left of you is doing and what the person to the right of you is doing. And when, even when you're not playing, you're still supporting your team and helping them out. Some final thoughts though. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Do not try to second city a team presentation. All it takes is for one team member to go above time. So if you have a 10 minute presentation with five speakers, if one person goes three minutes, that ruins all the, the, the timings for everybody else. You have to plan and you have to practice the transitions. A lot of people write those off. Those are the most important moments in the speech. So make sure you plan. So rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Team presentations are rehearsed because you have to make sure you're on the same page. Not rehearsing is sort of like a football team saying, here is a play on a sheet. Okay, now let's wait, let's go to the game and do it. No, no, no. Any football team will tell you that they see the play on paper and then they practice it. They do walkthroughs, they practice the play a few times on the field because it might look good on paper, but when you actually get on the field, it feels completely different. So you gotta rehearse and you gotta think, work, and perform like a team. You're not an individual on a team. Everybody has to support each other. When you're not speaking, you should know exactly what the other main points are in case somebody can't perform. You have to know what everybody's expertise lanes are. You have to know how can I support my team member when I'm not speaking so we all look good and look unified. It's a team sport. Team presentations is a team sport. So with that said, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go with others. So with team presentations, go far, with your teammates.